Let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life, ever, for one second, believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and has been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons, until last night, which is safe to say, marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We always have the same place we like to go when we camp with minimum effort, and our day started as normal as ever. But as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. And when I asked him what was wrong, he shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving around 12 or 1 a.m. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which, in Middle Eastern culture, is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed at that time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then, he spilt an entire bottle of coke on his phone. Then, he dropped it into the sand and then proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on which is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp press right against his arm, and he realized it was an unsheathed knife. He packed it with its case the previous night, and he later said it felt like something pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively, within a matter of a few hours, was certainly making both of us uneasy. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser, and they had a Nissan Ultima, so we didn't expect to encounter so many issues that we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, they got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in the sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip. And later... My brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he started feeling an evil presence around us, but he didn't want to say anything as to not ruin the trip and freak me out. So we ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which, again, was far harder than it had to be. First, our tow strap broke off their bumper. Tow straps cost about $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves, and a 20-minute job took more like 90. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark quickly, so we scrambled to build a fire to cook our dinner before we were asked to help the couple, and I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. However, my brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said, with clear fear in his voice, that we should do so as quickly as possible and that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We're Christian, so of course we thought it would help. But I think it accelerated everything that happened, 
and just made whatever was there with us angry. We finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine and pretty much just humoring my brother, until I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling, so I voiced it to my brother and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, and that's when we heard a sound very close to us on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big. Something that I could only describe as the sound of death itself, and it seemed to go on for several minutes. When I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean I was ready to have a heart attack right there and then. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see with better light, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. Sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us, then the shadows from behind the trees, I tried to get the shadows to change shape, walking around the trees and moving the lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. And you could really feel it, too. We felt like we weren't alone, and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees, so they weren't the ones snapping the twigs. I felt like whatever was there was getting closer, and I have never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling, and you just know it's one of those natural instincts that you shouldn't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly, but it was still very silent, and at this point, it was around 8 p.m., and it was unusual for that. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving away back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well, I know how they drive in the sand, and I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. The sound of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sounds of the car. And on the path was what seemed to be like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us, until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me, and under no circumstance to look through the window. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota Hilux, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to be easily ruled out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw was as we were getting close to the exit. We saw standing in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. I've only ever seen one deer in the 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock, and the deer wasn't moving at all, until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer, and again my brother, with a grasp and then very sternly said, to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him when we got on the highway what it was that he kept seeing, and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend and they were all pointing either right at us or ahead of us. We were still yet to encounter anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. When I saw the exit, I was happy as I ever have been, 
but that quickly faded when once again we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. Except this time, it didn't really look like a deer, more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer. And its eyes were milky, and it looked rotten and horrible. But I didn't much care, I just stepped on the gas, and fortunately, it had gotten out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, and then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with the same tone of voice, said to go to the town and to go left. Later, he once again said that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us. So if we would have gone that way, we wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away, and of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm. He also said that they caused bad luck and that he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. This is also my younger brother by three years, and naturally, any time he ever told me about this sort of thing, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw that night. I can excuse the gut feeling of just being scared. But I cannot excuse the two deers we saw staring right at us. And I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out as did the tone of my brother's voice, and it's safe to say, we're not going camping there again. I'm never dismissing my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again, and I am so thankful that we made it home safely. I just spent the summer out in the middle of nowhere in Florida, working at a summer sleepaway camp. This camp owns over a hundred acres of pure forest, and before it was a camp, it was an airbase. For quite a few years now, maybe much longer, counselors and campers alike have been having weird experiences out there, with tall shadow people. Normally there's a lot of fun storytelling at camps, but there is an eerie amount of correlation between some of these stories I've heard about this specific thing. Some of these people who have had these experiences don't know the stories from the others, like new campers having the same experiences as counselors from years ago. They all describe the same thing. Tall, thin, shadowy figures of men. Sometimes one, sometimes multiple. Their heads are apparently quite a bit taller than the top bunks in the cabins, which is a good eight feet at least. Campers have described them as having to duck to get through the doorway. Twice in the past couple years, an entire cabin has seen these things. Usually, the counselors would think the kids were trying to mess with them, but because of the sheer amount of these similar reported experiences from campers, it's being taken more seriously. I feel like something weird is going on, especially when multiple 13-year-old boys are crying because they're so freaked out. On one of these occasions, the campers said these shadow figures came into the cabin and pushed their bunks around. The next morning, marks were left on the floor where the bunks had been moved. On a different occasion, only one figure came in and just stood, facing the corner, and the entire cabin witnessed this. On multiple occasions, only one camper has seen this figure, and it has only stared at them from the middle of the room. I myself had not had any strange experiences all summer, except for one. 
I was in the cabin on the counselor's side, about to take a nap, but was not asleep yet, just recently laid down. I was on my side, facing the wall. There was nobody else in the cabin. Twice, within the 45 minutes I was there, something sat on the bed behind me. The cheap mattress sagged a bit, like if a person sat down, and I rolled a little. Of course, when I turned around, nothing's there. This happened to me and my girlfriend I was dating back in the summer of 2014. This all took place in South Carolina, and my girlfriend and I wanted to take a camping trip. We initially tried to go to a place 45 miles from our hometown, but they were going to charge us double what we thought we were going to pay for. We decided to head back, and it just occurred to me that there's a spot very close to where we live. Now, I will say, it's more boondocking and off-grid. We didn't have to pay for anything, just parked the car, and we got out. This place is quite gorgeous. There's a historic bridge and trail. Also, some of the oldest railroad tracks in the south. We got there before sunset, so we had plenty of time to pitch the tent and set everything up. There were a few cars when we arrived, but they were most likely hikers and would be gone by nightfall. The only thing that made us uncomfortable was a busted up and rusted old white van with no license plate. We both pointed it out, thinking it was weird, but we shrugged it off and started walking to a good place to set up camp. After several hours, around 3 a.m., following some quality time spent with her and taking in all the nature and then going to sleep, we started to hear this obscure singing and walking around our tent. Anytime you hear commotion that early in the morning, nothing good can happen out of it. I peered my head out of the tent to see what was going on. I didn't see anything or anyone, but nonetheless, I didn't want to stay in that area, and we were both freaked out. Just because I couldn't see anything doesn't mean it's not there. I barely did a decent walk around our tent. As we were quietly gathering our belongings, we swore we heard the singing get louder. I recall words in this song he was singing had, now won't y'all come out? Followed by this raspy laughing. <laughs> Once we finally packed the tent, that was when crunching on the leaves and his humming is what we heard. We knew this guy was close by, and we booked it. I grabbed her hand and threw the tent and folding chairs on my back. We made sure to run the opposite way from where all the noise was coming from. Luckily, we set up camp fairly close to the parking lot because I could see lights through the trees. As we ran and scurried away from whoever was chasing us, we noticed the lights from the parking lot wasn't just the street lights, but also, to our horror, it was that old, rusty white van we saw at the beginning. We hurried up the hill, just hoping this guy was alone. His van was right in front of me. If he had an accomplice, that would be another person to deal with. As we reached the lot, we got into the bright street lights. I noticed my girlfriend's hand make a slight twitch, and her pace slowed down from that. I could tell she was turning her head to look at our attacker. I heard her gasp loudly. Come on! Don't look! We're almost out of here! She focused back, and we continued running in unison. The guy was getting closer, as I can hear the noise of the gravel intensify. I heard his wheezing and him barking. Don't y'all think you can get away? As we just made it past the van, we split, and I handed her the keys so she could unlock and start the car, and I can throw all of the gear in the truck, and we can make it out of this place. As I frantically laid the camping gear in the back seat and head to the driver's side, that's when my body faced forward for the first time in a while. Every noise this guy was making was close and amplified now. With the car running, I kept my head down to put it in reverse, but curiosity got the better of me. 
in the brightness of my headlights. This man was a behemoth with a stern, wrinkled face with red patchy hair, a goatee that had dirt and crud smeared all over it. His eyes were fixated on us, like a scope magnifying on two ten-point bucks. He was wanting to kill. Get back here. He barked, waving a baseball bat back and forth. I shook my head, and with that I swerved out, and we were on our way out with our hearts racing. In the rearview mirror, we saw the man slam the bat in frustration. A narrow escape. We drove to a Waffle House and spent the rest of the early morning there until sunrise. On Friday, I left work at lunchtime to go for an overnight bushwalk to a remote campsite in the National Park that's about 60 kilometers from my work in Canberra. I decided not to take a tent as I was planning to sleep in a hut that had a fireplace, as it's still winter here. This hut is about a two-kilometer walk from any fire trails, and can only be reached by walking along a narrow foot track that climbs a hill for about 45 minutes. The hut only gets a handful of visitors each year, due to how difficult it is to find and reach. My car was the only one in the car park, and I never passed anyone else on the way. There's only one track in and out to this place. When it got dark, I started a fire in the fireplace and had my dinner. I was tired and decided to go to sleep around 8.30 p.m. as I planned to get up early to walk back to my car early this morning. Around 1 a.m., I woke up to the sound of a loud machine, really loud, like being directly under a helicopter or something. When I peered through the hut's window, I could see bright lights flashing around, lighting up the trees, but I couldn't see the source of the lights, which made me think that they were above me. There was no way I was going outside to investigate, so I just sat on a camp chair, wondering what the heck was outside. After a few minutes, both the sound and the lights suddenly stopped, like they had never been there. There was nowhere for anything to land nearby, as the hut is in a very heavily treed area. After a few minutes, I got the courage to go outside with my head torch, and all I could see was some grass that had been slightly burned around the hut. Nothing else seems to have been damaged or disturbed. I stayed up for the remainder of the night, and left for my car just before daylight came. There's no way that a vehicle could get to the hut and I don't think that search and rescue would have a helicopter up at night in such a remote area, and there's no Air Force bases nearby either. The National Park doesn't allow hunters, so I really have no idea what it was or what's going on.